This is the Get a Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Get a Life Podcast. We're here to have X-Cult Conversations. I'm Lane. With me today are Cheryl, Carmen, and Richard. Cheryl, could you tell the listeners the purpose of this podcast? Hi, everyone. Um, we are here to kind of have X-Cult Conversations and start to create a safe place to bring on ex-members to tell their story. Um, We're going to have some crazy laughs about things that we did and just kind of open up the door to have conversations that need to be had. And I I think this is a long time coming podcast. And Richard, could you tell us what is this cult that we want to talk about today? (laughs) Well, I, I think most of the listeners will know something about what it is, but, but some may not. So what we're really concentrating on is the so-called Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, who used to be non-denominational and, and just got called Exclusive Brethren or Plymouth Brethren. Um, but uh, they've been increasingly radicalized they started over 200 years ago but from the 1960s onwards they became radicalized and uh, extremist and in more recent years since around 2000 when Bruce Hales took over they've become increasingly obsessed with money and it has now kind of morphed into a massive commercial operation where the members of the cult all 54,000 of them are essentially a kind of a marketplace to which a small click at the top can market goods and services and receive extremely, um, you know, huge amounts of money in return. Um, And in addition, they use uh, businesses belonging to cult members uh, to um, lobby governments, to get government contracts, and um, it, it's basically turned into a huge money-making machine with a, a captive consumer base. Um, wow. So what you're saying is it used to be a church. It kind of started as a church. And since the early 2000s, it's turned into a, a business, basically. Like, well, a kind of a global mafia, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, it's um, it's incredibly exploitative of its members, um, and, and not only that, because they have so much to hide and because they need these members as uh, to make money from, they take extreme measures to prevent people from leaving. And people who do leave are harassed and persecuted and surveilled. And in particular, anyone who speaks out, they will. there's almost nothing they will stop at in terms of uh, trying to prevent someone from speaking up and kind of pointing out to the world at large that this is not the nice, warm and fuzzy Christian organization they claim to be. This is a very nasty um, and in some places criminal mafia that's exploiting its own members and also exploiting governments and other businesses and health services globally. Wow, that's huge. And Cheryl, you know about the criminal stuff that goes on there. Yeah, and I actually was just going to just kind of branch off of what Richard is saying, and not just with maybe, you know, teenagers that are rebelling, but coming to the reason, one of the reasons Carmen is where she's at is, I mean, Carmen can kind of explain her story, but it was the reaching out of so many teenagers that had left, and she was trying to help the situation. And I mean, Carmen, you can expand on that, on your story that, that got you to where you are. Oh, well, I mean, when we uh, first started to reach out and t- and try to change the situation, what we had seen was a, a huge number of young people that were just literally put out on the street. Um, and so we reached out to the elders and the, the leadership of this church and said, hey, this is not biblical. This is not what you say you are. You know, if you say you're a church, you say you follow the Bible. Um, why is it straying so far from that? And in that process, um, they made our lives so difficult that we had no choice but to leave it. Wow. And let's, let's expand on what some of these crimes were. Like it was the worst of the worst, wasn't it? 
Oh, worst of the worst, like, like advising brethren to kick out, like literally kick out a 13 year old, put them out on the street with their clothes and their possessions and say, you're out. You know, if you don't, if you don't agree with all of the stuff that's going on in the church, go and find your own way at 13, 14, 15 years old. We saw 18 young people put out and every one of those, their families were attacked. Their families were destroyed. I mean, as soon as you lose it, lose one of your family members, there's, there's a hole in your family. And what we addressed with some of the leaders in that, you know, in Maple Creek, which is where we were from, um, was this is the future of your church and you're putting it out on the street corner. You don't need a moral workshop to know that's wrong. No, no. (laughs) And the irony is that the brethren on their very, very fancy PR website one of their biggest slogans yeah. is family is at the heart of all we believe and all that we do. And nothing, nothing could be further from the truth because what they've done consistently almost for their entire history is to destroy families. Because exactly. they, it, it's deeply embedded in their psyche that the assembly, as they call themselves uh, blasphemously, incidentally, um, is more important than the natural family, that they use the terminology the first family and the second family, where by the first family they mean your natural family, and by the second family they mean the brethren organization. And it's consistently ministered that you must put the second family, you transfer from the first family to the second family. And indeed, if you go through any brethren congregation um, you know, their, their phone book, their list of members, you'll find that nearly every individual in that congregation has lost a brother, a sister, parents, grandparents, children, cousins. There w- it would be probably 80 or 90% of the members have a close relative that they've had to cut off and treat as if they're dead because that's what the church's rules have imposed on them. So excommunication. Yeah. Excommunication. And what did they call that? Let's let's let our listeners know what they called that. Uh, they call it withdrawing from. Yeah. Withdraw from. And why do we all know so much about this church is because every <laughs> single one of us was a member and yes. grew up in it. Every single one yeah. of us has been a victim of their abuse and their absolute terribleness. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, let's talk about maybe some news because maybe we'll have some brethren listeners in the future. Um, and I have a couple things I just wanted to talk about that, that's in the news. It's really current right now in the brethren, in the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And that is the moral workshop. And and Bruce Hales is going on about this. And why that's so silly is because I've never needed a workshop to help someone on the street that falls down, Right. If I see someone fall down and hurt themselves, I've never needed a workshop to know that that person needs help. But you do need a moral workshop when you excommunicate people yeah, because it's unnatural. So you have to go and you have to convince yourself that it's okay to cut off family members when it's really not. Really, it's it's very immoral. But the moral workshop is a total joke. So that's just written right off. What else is new? Roy Symington passed away in the church. He was a big VIP, uh, very good friends with my father. Um, And yeah, he passed away. Um, What else? Oh, we found out that marriages now, um, the man, the young man is to choose three different young ladies and speak to them simultaneously and then choose one and ask to marry. And the women of course, gets the perfect choice of yes or no. Wow. Isn't that a wonderful, this is definitely not a cult. This is just a mainstream church. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, everyone does that, don't they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what other, what other mainstream church could you go to that's going to partner you up? <laughs> the, church of, the church of matchmaker or... The misogyny in this church, it, it's so bad. Like, Richard, just why don't you describe, like, 
one little like in briefly like a night in church and how the women sit in the back and everything yeah 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 exactly so the women are the women are, have to be silent in church um and that's based on some scripture which according to the brethren's translation says they will not suffer a woman to speak or exercise authority or something and, uh, and whatever connection that may have been said in originally this is very conveniently used to to reduce women to the rank of somewhere between slaves and pets depending whether they're you know attractive or not um and, and so in church the women they sit at the back they have to sit behind the men the only role they have is to give out a hymn and all they can do is say the number. They can't, you know, say anything intelligible or intelligent. Um, and they aren't even allowed to use the microphones to do that. So a man has to repeat it for them. Otherwise, their voice might be too loud. Um, and, of course, the misogyny extends into every other area of life as well. Um, you go to Brethren's house for a meal. The meal is finished. The men all bugger off into the sitting room and sit around and talk business. It's the women who've slaved away to prepare the meal who have to clear the table, do the washing up, look after the kids, change the diapers, while the fat cats lounge around on the sofa. Um, business, likewise, women in business can't have a position over a man. They're, they're completely limited to the very bottom roles in any business. And then, of course, they're expected either to... Um, marry a brethren man to continue the progeny, the genealogy, or basically they just have to be, you know, live in their parents' house as old mates. Oh. Carmen, Cheryl, yes. what, did, what did that feel like being a woman in there? Well, the kicker of the whole thing is you can be um, the subject of their gathering and you cannot speak up. So they can they can attack you for a whole, you know, 55 minute meeting and you can't say a word. <laughs> it is torture. <laughs> well, let's I think we're starting to make up for that from this day, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it even goes right down to like, I mean, most people I'm I probably am assuming are gonna know my story. Um but it even goes right down to the abuse that happened in there with my, even myself is that the, my perpetrator, Alan Drever was, he owned me and he, you, I learned that from a very, very, very early age that if we went there on a break on Sunday, like I, I knew that he would have, I knew that I would be pulled aside from him, but right down to, um, his brother-in-law who Morse hope, who knew what was going on, but it's just, the men just have this way in there of making sure that they have everybody's back, no matter what's going on. And everything is covered up. Absolutely. Everything is covered up. And if they can't cover something up, then you are forced out. And yeah. like, I know for myself with, with the amount of priestly visits I had priestly visits on my paper route, the amount of people watching me like a hawk, as I got older, I knew I was being pushed out. I knew that Morse did not like that I was becoming of the age where I could be vocal. Um, I was a very strong-willed woman. Um, and, you know, it was do anything to be able to smash Barb and Danny's hope and let's see what we can do. until well, it's the victim. Yeah, yeah, let's mm. get the victim out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and to make it clear, it's not just in church servitors that the men um, control everything. The whole no. church administration is run by overweight, uh, middle-age white guys right around the globe. Um, always has been, um, always will be. Um, it's a completely masculine organization, masculine control. Bruce Hales even says himself, he even said to his wife, and it's in print, that all she had to do was look pretty. That is disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. You should have I had mean, pictures it, it will be their downfall because, um, you know, the human spirit doesn't respond kindly to that kind of treatment. No. Like, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and I just, I don't know, but I just remember sitting down for every meal, and we had to 
give thanks to God for the food. And I remember being like, mom cooked this, <laughs> right? Like I was like, mom worked on this for three hours. I watched her, you know? I don't know. That was just a weird thought I had. I remember just being like, okay, we're thanking God, but he didn't really bring anything. I, I went shopping with mom. I saw her cook it. She did everything. <laughs> anyway, that's just my two cents. <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, I used to help clear the table when, when we went out to other brethren for meals. I would help clear the table and I got these kind of funny looks. Uh, but, I, you know, I just felt bad about letting these poor sisters do all the work. The other little incentive is that the, the conversation in the kitchen was far more exciting and spicy than the conversation <laughs> in the lounge room. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I got my kicks there. But yeah. for the listeners, let's be clear. The, the, the woman in the household is expected to make three meals a day. And not just tiny family. meals. No. <laughs> every single day and all day on Sunday, massive, enormous meals. It's it's absolutely insane what they, oh, what they do. Uh, as well as all the washing and all the ironing and all the household tasks and looking after the babies and looking after any old people that need looking after and school trips and everything else. And don't complain and don't, and don't say anything about it. Yeah. 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 No, because if you if you complain or if you if you talk about it, you're being insubmissive. Mm. Yep. Oh yeah, submissive is a big word, isn't it, in the <laughs> brethren? Yeah. <laughs> so I found out something that's really interesting. I did not know this, I guess because I've been out for 14 years. Um Bruce Hales only goes to church maximum like once a week. What? Yes, this is a wow. fact. I've double checked this through <laughs> multiple sources, even in Australia. This is a fact. He goes to church at maximum now once a blankety blank week. Can you believe it? I remember as a kid, I went 365 days a year. <laughs> Every damn at day. Least, at least. Yeah. 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 Oh, and all day Sunday, multiple times. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And this blankety yeah. blanker is, is enjoying cocktails at home. Oh, so is he is he doing the Zoom ones or he's just just doing one a week? No, he uh one. Well, he does the Zoom ones once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and every one he does is recorded and put out. Yeah. And they're doing hybrids right now. So they're not actually all back to going to church every day. So they go sometimes during the week and then two nights is um over video Zoom mm -hmm. and they, they log in and. Oh, and get this, of course, the the positioning in front of the camera, because you have to be on camera too. Guess who's in the front row and who's in the back. <laughs> and that was corrected on some people's, I had like oh, I yes. have the insiders that have talked to me is that was corrected that if, if it was a family on a couch and they had to reposition themselves, yeah. If you're the not dressed, at the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the yeah. sisters, the women have to be at the back sitting behind the men. And yeah. apparently you can get kicked out for being like inappropriately dressed, messing around, doing stuff. <laughs> you know, we'll just kick you off. Right. Cause heaven wow. forbid a woman should have a thought. I mean, that's a scary <laughs> thought. <laughs> and the rule is they've got vaccination rules in. So you're not allowed um, in, like you're not allowed to go to meeting to church um, without, if you're not vaccinated. So if you're not vaccinated, you can't go. And you also, if you're not vaccinated, you can't go to other places like for breaks on Sundays and stuff like that, that you can't go, you can't interchange with other people. Wow. You have to be vaccinated. Oh my goodness. Yeah. What a little psycho. Yeah. I what really surprises me is they're keeping, <laughs> what really surprises me is that they're able to keep track of the vaccinated people and the unvaccinated people like in in america that would be against hipaa laws well like they can be sued it's some for that form. it's some from who was talking to me it's some form that they keep track on and i think it's checked like every sunday or something like that but it, it's checked yeah wow. like a business is not allowed to if somebody go, takes time off to get a um, covid test a business is not allowed now to ask what the results of that test are 
Um, there was a lawsuit down here and somebody won several million dollars um, because their employer asked them if the test was positive or not. And it went to court and the guy won. So yeah. that's why it really mean, shocked whole, me. This is a whole other area is that brethren have absolutely zero respect for anyone's privacy or their information. Uh, I mean, any organization, church included, are, are supposed to keep a record to know all of the information they hold on any individual and to be able to produce that information if the individual requests it, um, Freedom of Information Act. And of course, the church, call it the church, the, the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church holds vast, vast files and databases full of information, all its members. But if any former member requests under Freedom of Information to know what information is being held, they will get a reply saying, we hold no information on you at all. Yes. <laughs> I just have this from a from a um, reliable source in Australia that um, the Brethren Priestleys um, are sometimes recorded and, and written down the sins that are confessed and they're saved on databases. So just, just let that sink in for a second. Imagine if you found out that the Catholic Church had recording devices in their confession booths. Okay? This is so wrong. It's insane. Well, this absolutely. Is... And I mean, I, I, I have proof of that because when I got in trouble, I mean, they got me to write everything out. And it was sort of five or six pages. I went right back to when I was seven years old and wrote on every possible thing. And, you know, this is intensely personal and humiliating, embarrassing, self-incriminating stuff. Uh, and I handed over to the priests, as you know, I was expected to. And they said, yes, well, we'll send this to Mr. Bruce and so on. Um, anyway, a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call from some random brother in Australia I'd never heard of before, not even a familiar name. Oh, yeah, your case has been passed on to me. And he had a whole bunch more questions about this. So my entire, like, personal confessional was handed to a complete stranger. Um, uh, oh, yes. And of no doubt, you know, it was sent by electronic means, no doubt. It's filed in Sydney. It's filed in all over the world. And I mean, that's completely let's, illegal. Let's um, make sure that as our well listeners... as a betrayal of trust. Yes, exactly. But let's make sure our listeners know, in case there is any brother listening, if yeah. it if it is a topic that you've talked to your doctor or therapist about. You do not need to talk to the priests about it or anyone else. It is between you and your doctor, you and your therapist. Priests should never ask you about medical, health information, anything like that. No priest should. In fact, let's make it clear. You don't have to tell the priests anything at all. That whole no, thing your choice. is... You can say no. Regardless you can of... can say no. Exactly. But, I mean, also, I mean... Uh, and regardless of what your faith is, whether you are, you know, a fully biblical Christian or whether you're an atheist, let me tell you, there's nothing in the Bible that says to have your sins forgiven, you have to tell them to a priest. Yeah. I mean, we have all listened to the gospel. You, you, you confess your sins to God. God clears your sins. Your local priest cannot help you in that connection. And there's absolutely no scriptural basis for this idea that your sins can't be cleared unless you tell them to a priest. And I think this is where they lose everything because let's take, let's go, let's take into consideration, into consideration my story. So let's say that, I mean, we obviously I've made a police report. Um, let's say the the priests go in and talk to Ellen and Ellen reveals his sins, blah, 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 blah. And in their mind, he's become right. And now that pedophile, and yes, I'm going to call him a pedophile, gets to go back out and walk on the street because he's just been absolved of his sin because he confessed it. But no, no practical change has happened. And that's why when I've done my podcast before, I've pleaded with the community of Maple Creek and with the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church is that that man needs help. Like, could you imagine if they took that kind of consideration to their actual real issues that they are having inside there versus 
these little piddly things of like Richard Marsh and, you know, Carmen, like, could you imagine if Carmen's letter had been given that same kind of attention that they would have been as some guy in Australia that's phoning up Richard and saying, Hey, I've got your case. Like that. I'm hoping that's what comes out of this podcast is because we know that, that they listen from, from inside there. We know that they go and they find places to listen to them is that that's what has to happen is these big things need to be put on the table to be discussed and looked at. And it's not about just talking to a priest and having your sins absolved. And in their mind, you're right now that you can go and beat and abuse whoever you want. But if you go and stay shut up for seven days and you've talked to a priest about this and in their mind, you're right, you're now back in, right? They, I received a letter um, years and years and years ago from all the main trio of priests that had really, really, uh, jumped on our family and the letter was all the same between all three of them handwritten and signed by them. And to them, they had this idea, idea in their head that everything's fine now. And so I have written letters to my parents, to my siblings in, in explaining that just because you guys have changed things inside there with your rebranding and with what you're allowed to do now, as long as there is this separation and this hurt in those of the, the kids that have been left behind and nothing has been done to actually change these families that are in complete disarray and have been pulled apart. There's no, nothing's, nothing's fixed. It hasn't, the, the problems are not fixed. And I think that's the biggest delusion that they live in there is that they have this idea that if something is written or something is spoken and it's witnessed with a priest, boom, everything's it's magically tough. happened. It's all, it's, yeah. everything's better, right? The, mm. This world is just a beautiful place to live now. They mm. need to understand that a crime does not yeah. go away when you confess it to a priest. It is a fucking crime. Yeah. And the police are coming after criminals. Uh, let's yeah. just say that, right? We've, we've done our police reports, Cheryl and I. Um, oh, there's and, enough that have done them, yeah. Yeah. So, so let's make that clear to any brethren listeners that if you do something or a brethren member does commits a crime, just because you say to a priest that you did it and you feel bad, uh, 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 you need to go to the police. Their own leaders have in the past supported going to the police, JT Jr. or whatever. You have to tell the truth. And these, and that's what we need to employ, uh, em implore to, to, to listeners in the brethren come out and tell the truth yeah mm. well and they need to they need to drop this this feeling that they have that the brethren's um law and order is above yes the police it is not the law of the land is above the brethren's laws you know Absolutely, yeah yeah that's the one they trot out every time the assembly is the highest court in the universe well i say bullshit for that yeah, yeah. Protect the assembly is code for do not tell the authorities the truth. Now, remember that if you are told you need to protect the assembly, that is code for do not tell the truth to the authorities. And that is criminal. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and if the brethren were so good as they make out to be God's chosen people and this wonderful testimony, why would they need to hold secrets? I mean, Mr. Symington used to say, and I think it's to his credit, we've got nothing to hide and nothing to display. Well, look at the brethren now. Look at their display of RRT and bright red tents and million dollar websites. And boy, have they got a lot of stuff to hide. They're just so far from Christianity or loving that they claim to be. Like I listen to my guru and he's trying to tell people you should look at every human being through the eyes that you would look at your own mother. That's the kind of unity and humanity he's pushing. The opposite of unity and love is separation and division. So the yeah. number one thing that this Plymouth Brethren Christian Church stands for is separation from what they say is evil. That is the opposite of unity, the opposite of love, the opposite of encompassing and compassion. There is no altruism and compassion in the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. Hmm. And I mean, uh, uh, the, that brings up a very important point that this whole wall of separation they talk about is a complete illusion. 
So, I mean, the mental picture they like to build is if it's like a kind of a castle wall and all the good people are inside and all the wicked people and the enemies are outside. And if you break through the wall, the enemies will get in. Well, of course, what we know and what we're trying to expose on this program is there's many, many very evil, very wicked people inside yeah. the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And in pedophiles. fact, the system is, yes, pedophiles. And yeah. in fact, the system itself is evil and it, and it works together to hide and protect those evil people. So in fact, inside the wall, you people who claim to be withdrawing from iniquity, you're actually breaking bread with all these wicked people and you're helping to hide their crimes, you're helping to protect them. So what's the point of the wall? What's it separating you from? Yes, obviously there's evil outside the wall. No one's saying they're not pedophiles in the world outside of the brethren, but they're inside as well. So you're not separating yourself from anything. And the fact yeah. is that the so-called wall of separation is not there to keep the world out, it's to keep you in. It's to keep the brethren inside yeah. there yeah. so that Bruce Hales and his commercial cronies can keep milking you for more and more cash. That's the only purpose of it. 100%. Yep. 100%. Let, let me ask you guys all this quick question. Since you've all left, have you found the world to be more loving or more evil than you predicted? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely more loving. Right. You know what? And it was on our conversation lane that um, we had a conversation the other day when you said something that just was the most beautiful thing. And this is what I want to just before I make say the statement, I just want to say to those that are listening that are still inside um, is that their biggest thing that they use against you is that I was told every time I had a priestly visit, right, that if I left, they would eat me to me and spit me out was what we were told you know, every Sunday that was kind of drilled in there. Yeah. And, and your fear of leave, leaving is like, well, what about my family? Right. I'm going to have to leave my family. You've got parents, you've got, you know, you've got all this family you have to leave behind. And yes, you do. But what price do you, what, what, what do you want for your freedom? Do you want to have you, you're literally selling your soul to the devil. Literally you are, and you have that choice or you can leave your family and come out here and here's the statement that, 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 that Lane said. He said, we may lose our biological family, but we gain the world as our family. And that is 110% accurate. That everybody that is out there, there is 98% of the people out here are going to help you the way that you think that you're going to be helped inside. Yeah, it, the love is out here. The love is out here. Yeah. So much love. So yeah. much love from perfect strangers. Yeah. More compassion than I've ever seen in in even my like my immediate family. I mean, right? My extended family, my cousins, the love I've got out here. Oh, it fills my heart every day. Yeah. And of course, the brethren have to help their own, uh, and it's reciprocal. I mean, it's you when you go to this brother's house for a meal, then of course you expect he's going to come back to your house for a meal. So it's always a quid pro quo. It's, it's um, a two-way obligation. What amazed me when I came out is, is, as Lane said, perfect strangers would literally just have compassion on you, take you in for a meal, help you, go right out of their way, and they're not expecting anything in return. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the first time we went to church, I remember sitting there thinking, you know, there's so much that we're told that the world, the world doesn't believe this. The world doesn't know this. We, as the brethren were chosen and we're special and we yeah. get to, we get shown all this stuff that the world doesn't know. Well, it was amazing. The first time we went to church, I sat there and I thought, wait, they're saying stuff that I've been told they don't know. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's this shocking realization that yeah, they do, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And this is the thing is, is like the PBCC are not the elite that they think they are, right? And I understand it. I get it when you're in there, right? I mean, you're told that. I mean, I was talking to my paper out being told like, you know what? You're you're abandoning your position that this was, God chose you to be in this in in with the brethren and you are messing, don't mess that up. Don't mess up the position that you were gifted with. Well, you know what? 
I would much rather step outside, have to lose a family and regain my soul and be able to get the help I needed in order to be helped. Not once was I sat down and compassionately asked, Cheryl, what is wrong? Cheryl, what's happened? Nobody, nobody took that time to sit down and ask me what really happened to me. And you know what? If I'd had somebody compassionately ask that to me, I probably would have spilled my guts. But, you know, here it is 30 years later when, you know, thank goodness, the documentary came out, Richard came out, where I knew this is my time. I have, I ha and I knew I had to have a big landing pad. We had to have a big landing pad to be able to um, open up and be able to spill what everybody is now spilling right? I'm not just an isolated story. There's many of those stories, many who are still, um, you know, struggling with the idea of how to come forward and um, how to pre how to present it and still be able to manage life. It's hard when it's 30 years past of leaving. I mean, in my case, it's, you know, started when I was three years old, but it's like, you, I'm now living what feels like a, a kind of this dualistic world of where I'm having to bring up all of these past memories and I'm living what I felt like there was never allowed to express. At the same time, I'm trying to be this 47 year old woman who is still looking after her husband, who still is doing all these things in life. So is it easy? It's not easy, but it's very freeing. And I guarantee you, we have a list, a very, very long list of help that can help you. I mean, Absolutely. like, I can't tell you the amount of warmth of just even within the ex members that we have now, the, the, the amount of compassion and the amount of freedom and relief that everybody is feeling now that we've got this platform that's opening up and they're like, they're ready. They're all ready to just get it off their chest and be able to get on with life, you know? And that's what this platform is for. We want you to come on. We want you to get this off of your chest. Um, I don't care what it is you want to talk about. If you want to sit here and come and talk for an hour about a priestly visit you got, by all means, we welcome it. We want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I, I think I first, one of my first realizations about how small the brethren were was right after I'd left or right after I'd been confined which is their first level of kicking you out. And uh, I went to a football game in Montreal and it was at the Olympic Stadium and they announced that there was 50,000 fans in the stadium. <laughs> and it shocked me because I realized there was more people interested in this football game than there were members of the entire Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. They're, they're nothing. They're yeah. just like a million other cults and sects out there. And, and guess what? When you, when you talk to other people that have been in, in like cults or sects, they also think that they're in the perfect right church yeah. and it's all amazing <laughs> and it's blessed. They also yeah. think that they have secret material or writings or teachings that they need to protect. It's just like, oh, you guys are so cliché. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, they're just like all the others. They're just like a hundred thousand other cults all around the globe. Different names for things, different robes for the leader, but it's it, it's the same, same. You know, it, it word for word, it matches up. Yeah, and I got I got a little funny thing I want to read out here. So, just tell me if this sounds like a typical normal mainstream church. So they have a holding corporation called Global Funding Trust, okay? And then they use this term called the gap ecosystem, which basically means that we take outsiders' money and we keep it in. Gap, so then they have gap, all, you say. The G -A gap. Yeah, GAP, gap ecosystem. I thought ecosystem. that stood for gay and proud. Oh, they stole it. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then they have subcategories in this beautiful mainstream church. They have a subcategory company called uh, Campus & Co. That runs all their grocery stores. Yes, you heard that correctly. This cult has their own grocery stores in every major city. Then you have another sub one, the Bible and Gospel Trust. That actually prints out their stupid propaganda books and their videos that you must watch and listen to their recordings and everything. 
Then they have another one, the Universal Business Team, commonly known as UBT. This is their business coaching. They use it to group buy and get discounts. Um, and really, they use it to kind of control and buy parts of businesses so that they can actually have control in members' companies. Then they have one school, which handles all the entire church's schooling from kindergarten right up to high school. And of course, you're not allowed to go on from there. Then they have RRT, Rapid Relief Team, in multiple cities across multiple continents. This is their public relations firms that helps out in cases of disaster. They hand food out to firemen. I didn't know firemen really needed food and stuff, but whatever. Then they have Vision Accelerator. That is their private equity group um, that uh, basically for their big VIPs to buy massive uh, things and then to, to take over um PBC members, businesses. Then they have Community Trade Link. That's literally their version of Kijiji for members to buy and sell stuff on. Then they have this lame at attempt at Spotify called Trove, where it's only PBCC music allowed and all of it has to be pre-approved. Wow, I bet it's really fun, great music on there. So <laughs> they have all these things running their entire lives, their business, their food, what they see in their on their TV, at their internet, absolutely everything is controlled. Hmm. I don't remember Jesus doing anything like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it goes further than that because there's also uh, they also have their own life insurance company and their own well, their own health insurance company. They they buy all their cars through UBT run businesses. The, basically, Bruce Hales's aim is to capture the entire revenue stream yeah. of 55,000 people globally and make a profit on it. That's why he so, never yes, misses you a earn your wages. You get your generous wages working for your brethren business, but then every penny you spend, you're actually spending it with the church. So he claims it all back. <laughs> yeah. And what does he do? doing at home all the time with all this money <laughs> like there's no way he's just like you know going over the Buy a million dollar Moses <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well I mean that's nothing I mean we're talking multiple billions I mean millions yeah. is peanuts see he's far far more money than he can possibly spend and I mean I I, I saw this on I, I saw this on um on Twitter but I can kind of paraphrase it and say that I personally have far more money than the entire Hales family together because I have enough and they never will. Yes. How true is that? That's beautiful. So true. Yeah. So true. yeah. Um, they, the funny thing is, is they, they're so terrified of this place called hell, right? Which, uh, <laughs> my opinion only, but not a real place. Um, so they're terrified of this hell. And then you look at their lives from the outside, right? And they're these multimillionaires and sometimes even billionaires. And they can't go and do anything because they're not allowed to do stuff. <laughs> they can't go to countries where there's no brethren. So like, you're not going to see brethren members in Bora Bora. You know, yeah. you're not going to see them at a, at a resort in uh, Mexico or something, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they're locked and trapped inside their own massive mansions. And I mm -hmm. really think... That when it comes down to the average brethren member and you look at how happy they should be because they're in the one true church after all mm. then and then you look at how how sad and depressed they are and you realize oh they're in that hell they're yeah. already yes. there they created it yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and it's they're just um they're never gonna have enough money they're they're sick They've got the Levitical meetings coming up in two weeks over Zoom. Now get this. <laughs> um, yeah, my brother, uh, my brothers are going. My dad's going. Uh, some cousins are going. Um, a whole bunch in Boston are going. I think Manchester. I got a bunch of names there, but I, of course, I remembered my brothers. Um, but yeah, some get to only go for a day. And some get to go for uh, the full thing, but they have to go. So they go to the church and they watch it on a screen, <laughs> right? This is the big yearly meetings where Bruce Hales gives all the new orders, but not everyone can come. 
only some. And, and, and they say, because not everyone can understand it. Oh, oh my. Oh, what is this amazing information? Is it about the Bible? <gasps> like, like, it's just such gobbledygook. Um, when you actually hear them speak, it's, I like to call it nonsensical rhetoric. Uh, doesn't absolutely, make sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of some of their funny sayings. What would they say? Uh, I don't know. Do you guys remember anything funny sayings that they would say? Not off the top of my head. I try and forget. <laughs> Yeah, we have a list though. I want to because because you're going to hear us referring to this as a cult all the time. I want you to then you have that list. Hey, I want to go through why we. I mean, we lived it. We know it's a cult. Um, but this is this is an actual list. This, of, is, this list is from the International Cultic Studies Association. Yeah, I've been to the International Cultic Studies Association conference twice. Once in Montreal. Once in New Jersey. Uh, and I'm 99% sure that uh, I was withdrawn from because they found out I attended this <laughs> conference, <laughs> which is surprising. So get this, at the Montreal Interna International Cultic Studies Association conference, there was three priests there. My uncle, Johnny Fossey, Randy Cowie, <laughs> and Derek Cowie. Now, wow. why would the leaders of a mainstream church Wow. be at an International Cultic Studies Association conference. Hmm. Uh, unless I, they're a cult. <laughs> unless they're a cult. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's, let's read their list and let's see how many they tick off. The group displays excessively zealous and unquestioning commitment to its leader. Well, we now oh. know that Bruce Hales is now called the CEO, right? Like yep. that's what he's being referred to as, as a CEO now. So his, his yeah, his, his his rule is lost. So that one checks off. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Next one is questioning, doubt, and dissent are discouraged or even punished. Well, Carmen knows that one. Hundred percent. They'll run yeah, you out absolutely. of town on a rail. <laughs> That's two for two. Okay. Um, do they use any mind-altering practices? Well, we looked at this one and it talks about different drug sessions, chantings, anything like that. But it also says um, mediations. I We discussed this alcohol. and we think that mind altering substances would definitely cover alcohol, correct? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then it's 100% because like 90% of them are alcoholics and they even know yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. Um, the leadership dictates sometimes in great detail, how members should think, act, and feel. Well, yeah. 100%. <laughs> uh, hell yeah. Um, the group is elitist, claiming a special exalted status for itself and its leaders and its members. Uh, yeah. Checkbox. Mm -hmm. Lamb dunk. The group has a polarized us versus them mentality, which may cause conflict with the wider <laughs> society. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, this one's really good. Oh my. The leader is not accountable to any authorities. Yeah. Yep. Only do his big boy God. Him and him and God are yeah. the pals. Um yeah. <laughs> the group teaches or implies that its supposedly exalted ends justify whatever means it deems necessary. Yes. Anything for the assembly, protect the assembly. The leadership induces feelings of shame and or guilt in order to influence and or control members. Oh, they often never admit is, it, but they do. Yep, oh, often 100%. this is done through yeah. peer pressure and subtle forms of persuasion. I think priestly visits would fall right into yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, subservience to the leader or group requires members to cut ties with family and friends and to radically alter the personal goals and activities they had before they joined the group. So basically, that's um, excommunication right there, right? Like they, they require you to cut communications to anyone that leaves the church because we're all born into it. The group is preoccupied with bringing in new members. Now, at first, I was like, no, it doesn't recruit at all. But then Richard 
corrected me and said no, because they are so misogynistic. They view women as basically um, baby makers to help the church. And that's exactly true. Hmm. They, they're encouraged to have as many children as possible. Yeah, it, which, is why the brethren, which was why they have 55,000 of them, because they ban contraceptives, they encourage large families, and that's where they all came from. Yep. Yep, so, and the ones that, that the ones that don't obey and don't agree with them, just push them out on the street. Mm, that's the exactly. mentality. That is. Okay. Oh, here's another great one. The group is preoccupied with making money. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Okay, members are expected to devote inordinate amounts of time to the group and or group-related activities. What else do they do? Nothing. Yeah. Members are encouraged or required to live and or socialize only with other group members. Oh, my, oh, my. It looks like we're getting to the end of the list, folks. The most loyal members feel there can be no life outside the context of the group. Yeah. Yep. 10 wow. out of 10. It looks yep. like <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Slam dunk. Um, like that, that right there is a cult. So we've got money making, we've got hiding head dough files. Let me repeat that. There are, I allege, because I know that they're still in the church and they abused me. So I know that there's pedophiles yeah. in the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, and they're hiding up these things because I confessed it to the priests after I got confined. I told them about the abuse, and they said, well, look into it, and then they never spoke to me again. And my dad said, nope, she denied it. No. Nope. So they've got a bunch of criminals in there. How do we deal with that? Oh, shine a light on it. I mean, that, that's why we're here, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think this is a really important point because just imagine a society where you could walk down the road, put a brick through the jeweler's window, help yourself to a thousand dollars worth of jewels, and none of the passers-by on the street would even look round. They would just walk on, they wouldn't report you, the police wouldn't come after you. It would be chaos. And of course, if you were a criminal, you'd think, this is great. I can get away with this. I can do this, and no one's going to say anything. And, and that is exactly how the Brethren have been. Right up to now, the priests and the leadership, they think they can do anything to anyone who leaves, any opposer, anyone they disagree with, uh, and everyone's going to be too afraid to speak out. Uh, and so they, they, we have taught them. We have taught them that they can get away with it. Yeah, so, and it stops now. Yeah, it stops here. And this is what this podcast is about, calling them out. And, you know, not only to get redress for things that have happened in the past, but also to make it so that the very next time a priest, so-called priest or leader, thinks of doing something mean or illegal or criminal or immoral to any other of his fellow men, women or children, they are going to have this nasty little nagging thought at the back of their mind. What happens if that person gets on the podcast and tells the world about it? And that's how you hold them to account. Yes. That's what we're asking. We're asking other people that are ex-members or members that are sitting on the fence right now and thinking about leaving. Man, there's benefits to telling the truth. You know yeah. what? You feel better. And coming forward doesn't feel like crap because people are are there to help you. Is it hard? Is it easy? No, but it's relieving yeah. to, to tell the truth. I know that there's people listening to these things and they know, they know the terrible things the brethren done. And if they could just find the strength to go to the cops, the cops are waiting. They're waiting. <laughs> yeah. Or contact us and we'll give you cops that will listen to you. We'll give you numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's just a matter of understanding that if you're, it, it is a time, the time is now where you have to take a stance, right? If you're not, if we're not, if you're not changing things, and I say this to my family, I say this to my siblings, I say this to everybody that is in there, that if you are not changing things, and if you believe that you are above the law, and Ellen is still roaming the streets of Maple Creek, 
Do you're we... part of you're part of his. You're a part of the issue. You are a part of the issue. Cheryl, do we know whether is is he still has he been kicked out or confined anything? I from what I've heard that no, he like I someone had told me that he was still going to meeting. And so when we talk about telling the truth, so when I when I did my police statement, the truth, I had to let all of my walls down and let I mean it was the hardest thing I ever did to let that truth, let the whole truth come out again. I knew that when the truth is spoken, you cannot wash it away. You cannot pay it off. It only grows power, right? I have to be patient. Absolutely. Right up into the other day now, where the Hutterites are now considering speaking up because they saw my podcast and they are now, they know, they know of what went on. They know of what's going on. And if we're ever, if we're ever going to make any kind of a difference, you have to stare fear in its eyes and realize it's just a freaking fake bark, right? You just, it means that fear, your fear is just what is programmed into you. The truth is way more powerful. Change comes from when you speak the truth. And so I do, I get very frustrated. I get so frustrated to know that if they believe that they're above the law, we know they've seen my podcast. Like I I know my brothers have watched it. I know my siblings have watched it. I don't know if my parents have, but I know that there are people within there that have seen this podcast. If you have seen the freaking podcast and you're allowing Ellen still to be wandering around, you're part of the problem. What if... Your child was the next one. And I can tell you that he still is doing what he's doing. I mean, he's, his hands are still roaming free. And it's just not right. It's not right. So if you guys can't take matters into your own hands and, you know, deal with shit, this is what you're getting. You're getting a bunch of ex members who are all standing up and saying, it's done. We're done. And that doesn't mean we're bitter. It doesn't mean we're resentful. It means that accountability has to happen. And accountability does not mean sitting in a living room full of men and witnessing people telling their sins. No, we're talking that the crimes have to be dealt with. Absolutely. So you're not just helping yourself by speaking out, you're helping other people. Yeah. And, and, and really, really importantly, um, there are... Uh, nearly 9,500 children in the Brethren. Probably if you include the children right down to babies, there's 10,000 children in that Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And there's no social barriers. There's no kind of social responsibility about being protective against possible pedophile activity. Um, If you're in the church or if you've left the church and you know that someone in there is a pedophile, or any of that kind of activity against children, if you keep quiet, that person is enabled to carry on in the community, molesting people. You're you're responsible to speak out if you know about this. Because you're, you're just... The reason to speak out is to protect those children who are in there. They're not being protected at the moment because the church hides these things. They allow pedophiles to continue. And that's 10,000 children around the globe. I mean, how many of them, I mean, how many of them have been abused today of those 10,000 children? It's not just Alan Dreamer. No. We know no. many, many cases all around the globe where there are, there's been pedophiles in the church, and in many cases, they're still in there. And I mean, Alan Dreamer wasn't even just children. I mean, we know current cases that where it's grown women right? Like it's grown women that he just feels entitled to. And so Mm. like, we just, it's just, we have to find our voice. Like we have to find our voice. And I know, especially with the women, it's hard. And it's still, even after you leave, it still carries on of how do I find my voice? How do I, how do I let my voice say what it needs to say? And I mean, I know I'll wake up tomorrow morning after doing this podcast and I'll have my vulnerability hangover and, you know, question everything that I said, but every time it gets easier and it gets easier because I'm taking back my power, right? The, especially the women that leave the brethren and the women that leave most, you know, cults and very heavily, 
sex that keep you, the women very much contained is that the more practice you have, the more you find your courage and get up and just say the tiniest little thing. So these podcasts aren't necessarily one-on-one. We've created them to be conversation, right? Um, it's an easy way for us to step in. There could be six, seven of us on here. If that's what you want to have conversation and to make it light, to make it easy, but in any way, shape or form, we have to start finding our voice. All of us have to start finding our voice and we will, we will help you in whatever way to be able to help you find that voice, help you work through the fears of finding that voice and help you after we're here for you. And that includes those that are in those are that, that includes those that are trying to leave. Those are those that, that includes those that have been out for 40 years. Because we do know that the backpacks have to come off. We have to unzip them. We've got to shake the crap out of them and we have to be able to move on. But we can't fully move on with this if we're always keeping this tucked away somewhere or if we've drank it away before or if we like there's we've got to find that um, point to be able to sit and say, you know what, there's enough of us now to be able to sit down, hold hands and not necessarily sing Kumbaya, but you know, let's let the, let's unfold it. Absolutely. And that can, that can, that can be anything. Like we have a new email. We'll send, give it to you guys at the end, but email us what you want to talk about. We've had lots of discussion of kind of topics that we want to talk about from um, the discipline process to alcoholism, to um, how they treated women to what happened in the priestly business, what it was like to be shut up, what it was like to be withdrawn from, what happened after you were withdrawn from, what kind of therapy got you through, what therapy has been useful and what could be useful for other people. So it's about us coming on here and really sharing our tools, sharing, we're all in this together and not even just the PBCC, right? We, we would love to invite other people on from other cults. Like we know we've got, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, we've got um, people from other religions, that are very much similar to the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. And so we're inviting all ex-members from very religious sects that have been, Victimized. we've not been able to be who you are. We're just, we invite you all on here. We want to make this a, remo- a movement. And it is not about, we're not sitting here trying to, poke fun at religion. It's not, it's about healing. This is about healing for us once and for all. We all have been waiting for this. Um, And there's ways, there's ways to work with police for safety. There's ways I'm very safe. I am very safe. I am like literally the touch of a button away. There's ways to do it. There's ways to do it, to keep your safety. And sure. Yes, they can mess with your, computer they can mess with your (laughs) your service to your house they have ways that they can sit there and be a pesky mosquito but there are ways around things all right go ahead lane no that was good um i was just gonna say like um i know because i talk to ex-members and i talk to people who are in the church all the time and there's sometimes a big love of money right And they define success as the amount of wealth and square footage you have in your house. And if you're thinking of leaving and you want to be a billionaire and you want to be super, super rich, I'm telling you, you you chose the wrong thing then because that's not what life is about. It's not about money. And what it, for me, what it was about was going on my first all-inclusive vacation and scuba diving in the Caribbean and going, Oh, my brothers are never going to do this. Right. And then my first time at an orchestra, I was like, Oh man, my dad would love this. They'll never see this either. Right. (laughs) So if you want to judge success purely on money and how many businesses you can own and how many cars and how big your house can get, then, then stay in the brethren. You probably have a good chance of succeeding at that. (laughs) But if you want to do things like actually live a life and become anybody you want right you can put on any and play any role and character you want in life then then leave the brethren and go and explore and and try things for the first time like 
goodness gracious, like sailing on a boat or something or jump out of a plane or climb a mountain or go on a vacation or go to a restaurant and have, guess what? They're not going to know what this is. It's called sushi, Plymouth Brothers. <laughs> and only the Japanese can make it properly. And trust me, you've never had it. You've never had it, okay? Yeah. Oh, like think of the cuisine they're just never going to eat. And that just warms my heart. Yeah. And you only live once. So, I mean, the yeah. thing that terrified me at a certain point when I was in the Brethren, I saw these old brothers. Um, in fact, I'll tell you who it is. It was David Voss. He was an old South African brother who had never done anything wrong his entire life. He had an incredible knowledge of scripture. He had been a sort of a semi-heavy, I think he'd taken one or two fellowship meetings. And in the reading, he would open up the scripture and he would get very animated and enthusiastic and um, eloquent. Uh, uh, but he actually worked for the family business. And when he wasn't actually in the meeting, he was the picture of misery. He would shuffle around saying, oh dear, oh dear. And then he would go to his computer when he's supposed to be working and you'd be scrolling through like priestly emails about other people's sins. And, and this was the guy who was right at every turn, at every like juncture of the testimony. He supported the right guy. And, and I thought, you know, this, the funny thing was, he, you know, he had, he, had, he had a family, he had kids. They didn't really like the guy. They had absolutely zero respect for him. But, you know, like all the heavies and all the, you know, adjoining Lakatis thought this guy was great. Because when they saw him in the meeting, he was this animated chap and he would talk about eternal life. The guy didn't have a life. It was just a little kind of um, rush of enthusiasm that, you know, he's on the front row, he's got the microphone, and he sort of stirs up this enthusiasm. And, and the guy was miserable. He was miserable. And I thought, well, this guy has done everything right for the whole of his life. And this is what he's got. He's got a crummy little house. He's got a wife who barely speaks to him. He's got kids who don't respect him. And he's miserable. And I thought, well, you know, if I had done everything right, this is the best I've got to look forward to. This kind of miserable old age with nothing to look forward to, but, you know, taking a final ride in the brethren's hearse. And um, that terrified me. You only have one life. You only have one life. Imagine getting to the end of your life, and never mind you've got 10 million in your bank account. Yeah. You look back at your life and you say, well, all I've done in my life is make money for Bruce Hales. I've never been here. I've never been there. I've never climbed a mountain. I've never scuba dived. I've never done all the things, you know, in God's creation that I could have experienced. All I've done is attend meetings and make money and give it to Bruce Hales. And that's terrifying. It That is so terrifying. You're right. And the thing is, they shouldn't be like that old man because they're in the one true church that was chosen <laughs> by God. So every single member, and remember this, brethren members that are listening, you yeah. should be much happier than the Dalai Lama. You should make mm. the Dalai Lama look depressed, okay? <laughs> because you're in the one true church and you have Bruce Hales. So if you're not the happiest people on earth, then maybe it's not the one true church. I mean, they've got everything because they've got all the spiritual blessings because, you know, they're the God's chosen people, this tiny elite. Plus, they've got far more money than anyone else. These people should be bouncing off the ceiling with joy. <laughs> and the fact is that they, the, basically the choice they make every day is, do I overdose on alcohol or antidepressants? <laughs> or maybe just mix them into a cocktail? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, reasonable. Who gets away with drunk driving today? <laughs> Yeah. Oh. I'd advise them to get a blender because it kind of breaks down the pills and it goes down more smoothly, you know, in the, <laughs> in the scotch. They they drink their propaganda every night at about <laughs> seven fifteen p.m. in yeah. church. <laughs> you know, they and they got to repeat it to themselves over yeah. and over and over. You got to repeat it like a mantra, like yeah. a moral workshop. Like it's just. <laughs> a mantra. That's all it is. It's a mantra and people do it all the time. And you can say good ones. You can look in the mirror every morning and you can say, 
I'm a loving, nice, kind person, and I want the world to be loving. Or you can look and say, I'm a piece of shit. I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> right? Like, that's what the brethren want you to do. They want you to look in the mirror yeah. and say, oh, wretched person that I am. That's disgusting. Yeah. Don't you believe that God made you? Why would he make something disgusting? So yeah. so the, their own contradictions and their own beliefs are, are ridiculous, right? Like, imagine teaching people self-hatred instead of self-love. Yeah. Like, oh, it's so gross. And I think the biggest thing that that anybody in there can do is that instead of having the saying, what would Bruce do? It should be, what would Jesus do? Yeah. That's what you need to switch. <laughs> That's the first thing you need to switch is that saying, because I, there is nowhere in the Bible. Does it say that you are supposed to switch out those two though? You should not be switching out those two. And from the sounds of it, that it is not anymore. What would Jesus do? It is what would the CEO do, which is in this term now, the CEO equals Bruce Hales. Come on. Like, I, I guess I just. Do they think they're fooling people with CEO? Yeah, I just, <laughs> just that, like that one's a really hard one for me to digest in the sense that, okay, you know, you go back to JT June, the whole thing between mixing commerce and, and, and the, and the, the church, it's just like unheard of, but yet yeah. you go, how many, how many years later now, when now the church is the business. Like, I just, I want to, I would love to have had the conversations with my parents now. Like if I could just call them up and be like, are you kidding me? Like, are you like, <laughs> where, what kind of glasses are you wearing? Like, I understand you've got probably, you know, 30 grandkids in here, but come on, get them all out. Like you literally are in, you are working for somebody. This is no longer a Christian church. It's just not. An ex member said it perfectly to me recently. He said, the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church have become pay to play. Yeah. <laughs> got to pay to play. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Money goes yeah. up. How come it never comes down? Have, you, yeah. have they asked themselves that? Why have they never got handouts of cash for how rich everyone's becoming? Why are they yeah. always sending money up? Sounds like a mafia to me. Yeah. And it's knowing, too, that you have a choice. When you're told something, you don't have to take it at its word. Right. You have a choice to investigate. You have a choice to investigate. So let's go back to, I know we should probably wrap this up soon, but let's go back to um, the, the five people at Stephen Harper's um, acceptance speech. Okay. And I know that you guys are being told inside there that they were there to offer, let him know that they were offering their support and prayers for him. Why would five people be in the front row of Stephen Harper's acceptance speech to tell them that he's praying for them. Could they not just call him? Like you have to understand, use some logic here that that's not true. They're feeding you a line of bullshit, exactly. that that's not true. So I know I'm being told by my siblings and anybody I talk to, oh, Cheryl, you know, 99.9% .9 of everything you hear, it's, it's just false, it's lies. That's what they tell you, that everything is lies. I can guarantee you that I know more about what is happening inside your, your four walls than you do. So you should be listening to what we are saying. Even if you don't believe it, I want to, I challenge you to open up and actually listen. Like, hmm, I'm just going to listen to this and see, maybe it could be. Because maybe it could be. Don't be a scaredy pants. Don't be scared of hearing the truth. If you're in there listening to this, you know, um, listen to the truth. Listen to this Cheryl story. And as heart-wrenching as it is, listen to all of it. Listen to my story. Listen to Richard's story. Yeah. Listen to Carmen's story. And there's there's nobody lying out here. Nobody wants to to hurt Bruce Hales. Okay. As much as he'd like you to believe that there's there's snipers out there, the idea of counter snipers for Bruce Hales is the funniest thing I've heard in many years, and it still <laughs> makes me laugh a lot. Because I'll just let you know, there's no snipers out for Bruce Hales. Um, Anyway, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 it's when you've been broken the way that we are, we have been broken and been able to repair those broken bones and stand back up. It isn't. This is not about retaliation. I wish I could just scream that from every fiber of my being to everybody inside there. This is not about retaliation. This is about transformation. You need to reform what's happening in there and there has to be accountability. 
that is what we are based on. That's what this is about. So as much as you want to say that, you know, we're lying or these are lies and we're, you know, just opposers that are gathering steam and has nothing to do with that. Nothing whatsoever has to do with that. This is about healing. Yeah. And, um, you know, if we're full of crap, um, be respectful, but come on the show and, uh, and just tell us how you feel and we'll talk about it because mm. your opinion is going to be valued. We're not going to be mean or rude. Uh, if you're an ex member, please reach out. Yeah, we would love let's, to hear. Uh, from you. Let's have some more people on, and let's have more of these conversations. <laughs> I know it sounds like we so sat here and did a. It sounds like we sat here and did a plea for the people inside, which it was. I mean, because we know that they're listening, but we also we also wanted to just make sure that you guys are all the ex members are aware that you know we want to invite you all in to start this healing process on a, on a, on a global level and to be able to just come on and find your voice, tell your story and just be amongst all of us that are all trying to do the same thing. And there really isn't, is there's not an end game in this. I mean, I tell my therapist that all the time that I probably be 95 years old and still having a trigger and that's okay. I mean, that's totally okay right? I've got my back. I know I have support. And as long as you have those two things, you can get through anything. Awesome. Well, guys, this has been great. Do you think that's it for a first episode? I think so. Yeah, I think I think that's covered a lot of ground. It's awesome. Let's do another one in soon and let's have more topics that we can cover. Yeah, and we just hopefully we'll have some next members joining us. Okay, take care you all. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me.